Have you ever dreamed of exploring another world? Could you witness something new? Push boundaries? Or reach for your greatest hope? The experience of every generation is yours. On the History Channel, where the past comes alive. The Patagonian coastline of Argentina is as beautiful as it is dangerous. For a team of explorers, its waters hold the relics of one of the most daring voyages of all time. September 20, 1519, a fleet of five ships sets sail from Spain. The target is the lucrative Spice Islands. Their course is uncharted, their future unsure. This 16th century odyssey will have all the elements of a great adventure. The stories there have everything, including sex, including mutinies, intrigue, murder. Through it all, one man's drive will pull the expedition into infamy. In doing so, his name will echo around the world he circumnavigated. Fernando Magalhães. Fernando de Magalhães. Ferdinand Magellan, the great discoverer. Now, almost 500 years later, a band of modern-day adventurers are on the hunt to recapture one of Magellan's lost vessels, the Santiago. The Santiago is the only possible relic left of the greatest exploration. Armed with determination and modern technology, these men will battle the same winds and waves that pulled the Santiago to its grave, and if they aren't careful, to theirs. The weather conditions started to change and the wind started to pick up. We can actually see that we were not moving, and the worst of all, we lost the second boat. We need to find those guys. One of the things that you learn very quickly diving is what the sea takes. She doesn't give up very easily. These modern explorers will experience the same challenges, emotions, and peril their counterparts did centuries earlier, all in the name of discovery. The search is on for Magellan's lost fleet. In May of 1520, Magellan's fleet is anchored in San Julian on the coast of Argentina. They have been stranded here for several weeks, impatiently waiting for the harsh Patagonian winter to break. Eager to move forward, Magellan, the Captain General, gives instructions to his smallest ship to move out on a scouting mission. He orders the Santiago to sail down the coastline in hopes of finding the elusive passageway to the west. Captain Juan Rodriguez Serrano is piloting the ship down the coast when trouble hits. A storm struck. Serrano very skillfully took one of the spars with a piece of sail on it and used it to replace the rudder that had been washed away by the storm. What they tried to do was hold their ship off as long as they could from going to shore. And they were being pushed in the shore, perhaps by tides at that point. And then they fought their way, looking for a place to land that ship, save the ship, but more importantly, save the crew. Everyone got off except one man, and that was Serrano's personal servant who uh, was last to get off, and he was about to jump ashore, but he mistimed his jump and was carried away by a wave. He drowned. As the rest of the crew dashes for shore, the ship is left to the mercy of the sea. The ocean waves prove overwhelming as the Santiago is pounded into pieces. The crew is safe. The Santiago is thought to be lost forever. It is a cold, dark winter's night in New York City. However, inside 46 East 70th Street, electricity is heating up the evening. The building is home to the New York branch of the Explorers Club. Since 1904, this internationally known society has been the meeting point and unifying force for explorers and scientists worldwide. We're not interested really in people who want to go around the world in their boat or climb a mountain somewhere unless there's a reason, something that hasn't happened before that, in a sense, adds new light, new scientific light uh, through exploration. For the men and women in this room, exploration isn't a thing you read about in history books. It's a way of life. Tonight, they are enjoying a farewell dinner before they head off on the adventure of a lifetime. Leading the way is Bob Hem. His resume includes pilot, skydiver, and world traveler. 
Hem is a retired businessman who has never retired from adventure. I think exploration was in my blood from, from being a little kid. The reason you do it, I think, is because you want to want to see something that no one's ever seen before, look at a different perspective, and you get a chance to see the world. No other endeavor really moves me quite as much. Hem is the torchbearer for the spirit of exploration that inspired men like Columbus, De Soto, and Magellan. That spirit now leads him and a team from around the globe to the bottom of the world in hopes of uncovering one of history's greatest finds, the Santiago. The Santiago is the only possible relic left of the greatest exploration perhaps in the world. So if you're an explorer, it's almost like a religion that to find a piece of the Santiago is like finding, oh, the Shroud of Turin, the, the, the nail of the cross. We don't know where we, if we are eventually going to find something or what we're going to find, but um, that's the reason we're doing all this. We don't know what is going to happen, but we do it. This adventure actually begins in the early 1990s when a local Argentinian named Edgar Peralta makes a discovery along the Argentinian coastline. I found a large piece of wood and when I realized it wasn't just a regular stick but a piece of a mast, we put it on our shoulders and carried it up to the road. Scientists at the museum in Ushuaia in Argentina excitedly begin examining the find. An early carbon dating test provides encouraging results, dating the piece as early as the 16th century. We used the radiocarbon dating, which gave us the year 1520. The second test came up with 1522, so it's a very small difference. But more scientific research needs to be conducted, and the Argentinians look north for help. And they asked us to come down from the Explorers Club, to send a group, a team, to go down and verify this. We said, let's go there, scout the place, take samples of the mass, and bring it back here, and try to get them dated. In the spring of 2000, that is exactly what they do. Armed with notebooks, metal detectors, and a video camera, the team heads south. And this is where the mass was found. It was found embedded in the bank, but here. The trip proves to be everything the team has hoped for. They examine Peralta's mast and bring a sample back to the United States for more precise testing. The team also takes the time to explore the cliff-laden coastline. Excited by what they find, the team makes a decision. We said we're gonna come back. <laughs> we gotta come back. It's a, it's a beautiful area. It hasn't been touched by civilization since the 1500s or earlier. So if you're looking at an area that's pristine, that has a possibility of finding anything, you couldn't find a better place to look. And in the winter of 2002, that is what they are preparing to do. In doing so, they pay homage to the man who led the most daring voyage of his time, Ferdinand Magellan. For a future explorer, there are few better places to be born than in Portugal in the 1400s. Though small in size, the country is a leader in nautical exploration during a period historians have come to call the Age of Discovery. Portugal, at the end of the 15th century and the beginning of the 16th century, was very influential in Europe even though it had small dimensions, 89,000 square kilometers. It was a highly respected country due to the impact of its discoveries. It is into this seafaring nation that Ferneo Magallanes is born in approximately 1480. The man the English-speaking world would come to know as Ferdinand Magellan lives in northern Portugal, a member of a family of minor nobility. This small rank of nobility provides the young Magellan with a unique opportunity to serve as a page in the Queen's court. Pages served what we would view almost as an internship or an apprenticeship uh, at the royal courts. In his formative years, in his teenage years, he would have seen all of the excitement about global exploration uh, from the Portuguese point of view. It is during this time as a page that Magellan first encounters Manuel, the queen's brother who supervises the pages. Instantly, the two develop a relationship. It was a poisonous relationship. 
Magellan's family belonged to an element that opposed the royal aspirations of Manuel's family. So that was one of the misfortunes of, of, of timing for Magellan, was that he came under the guidance of a man who hated his family. It is a hatred that will never fade and will forever change the course of history. His time as a page fuels Magellan's desires to sail the seas. Impatiently, he awaits his opportunity. It comes in 1505, in part thanks to his old nemesis Manuel, who was ascended to the throne of Portugal. People have said that King Manuel desired to be the emperor of the world. He wanted prestige in all the world and Europe and considered himself a monarch with imperial ideas. His symbol was the sphere, the sphere representing the world. King Manuel's desire for expansion is heightened when the Portuguese established trade routes around Africa to India. Seeing the potential for huge profits and power, he organizes a 22-ship armada in hopes of gaining control of the Indian Ocean. In need of sailors to fill the armada, King Manuel allows Magellan to join the fleet. When he did, he took full advantage of it. He proved himself a, a fearless uh, warrior when they were involved in sea battles or in land battles. The lowly seaman whose name doesn't even appear in early ship logs quickly climbs the ranks. As he sails with the fleet, Magellan gains invaluable experience and information. The knowledge he learns leads him to believe that the lucrative Spice Islands are reachable by sailing west. The islands, also known as the Moluccas, are located in the central East Indies. In the 16th century, few things can match the value of the spices these islands have to offer. You have to realize that there was no refrigeration in those days, and that uh, it was very difficult to keep meat for any length of time. So it, it was known that some of the Far Eastern spices were very good at preserving meats. And for this, they became extremely valuable spices became more valuable by weight than gold. Magellan longs to put his theory to the test. If he is right, it could mean a faster route to the east and in turn more profits for the Portuguese. For him, there is glory and respect to be won. In 1515, he returns to Lisbon in hopes of gaining an audience with King Manuel. His desire is twofold, to ask for a raise and to lay the groundwork for a potential voyage. Portugal already had a perfectly viable route around Africa to India. So for the Portuguese, the notion of sailing westward to find anything was a non-starter. Uh, it was simply not an appealing notion to them. In addition to this, there were the factors that Dom Manuel of Portugal had already had experience of Magellan. And the king was simply tired of this constant pestering uh, for great higher allowances and therefore wasn't terribly prone, actually, to favor Magellan. Stunned by the king's icy reaction, Magellan makes a drastic move to save his dream and his future. He asks the king that he be allowed to take his services elsewhere. A disinterested King Manuel responds that Magellan may do whatever he pleases. With his freedom granted, Magellan makes one last attempt to save face. In a sign of respect, he moves forward to kiss King Manuel's hand. In one last act of disrespect, Manuel pulls his hand back. The king finally considered him a terrible pest and eventually insulted him to the point where Magellan was driven from the court with all the courtiers around laughing at him. Insulted but not deterred, Magellan is firm in his belief that the Spice Islands are reachable by sailing west. Columbus has seen the New World. Balboa has seen the Pacific Ocean. It is Magellan who believes in the unseen, a passageway through the Americas that would lead to the great ocean. Now, he just has to find someone to believe him. Upon returning from Patagonia, Explorers Club members are determined to go back with the search team. However, before any divers hit the water, there is work to be done. T. 
team members immerse themselves in research, hoping to develop a picture of what exactly happened on board the Santiago. Planning for an expedition is a lot of work, and you should get involved in a lot of history. And we looked at all the parts and pieces we could find that would give us that story. While historians differ over the exact details of the Santiago's demise, surprisingly, most agree on one thing, where the ship went down. They all agree that the distance was three leagues from the mouth of the Santa Cruz River to the point of the wreckage. And three leagues is about 10.3 nautical miles, 17 kilometers. We said, okay, let's get that 10 mile point and say, let's go a little bit south of that, a little bit north of that, and we have a game plan there. While historical evidence points to the 10 mile point, there is still the question of Peralta's mast to be answered. The mast was found several miles further south. Should that area be searched? The question is answered when the carbon dating results of the mast come back. More exact testing dates the piece in the 1600s. It isn't the Santiago. The team members haven't arrived yet in Patagonia, and already they have checked off one potential area. As one door closes, however, another opens. Hey, Bob. Hey, do you Just days before they prepare to leave for Argentina, the expedition gets a surprise from team member Uberto Sagramoso, already in Argentina. Uberto called us and said, listen, I just found this guy that he is completely sure that he found in Santiago. Mario Hernandez, a quiet native of Santa Cruz, has spent endless hours researching the history of Magellan's voyage, especially the voyage of the Santiago. And initially he was very shy about telling us something, and finally he opened himself and he said, listen, I'm going to show you this place, this secret place, this place that I know it is. The Santiago is very important because not only is it a cultural treasure for our town and region, it is also a treasure for all humanity. Hernandez has spent countless mornings walking the beaches, looking for ship debris that washes up on shore. There isn't much entertainment in my town, but a few friends would get together and walk around the coast. As we did, we began to find pieces of wood. Mario is positive he knows the location of the Santiago. He points to an area the locals call the Bay of Santiago. His site, however, is a few miles south of where the historical data points. Team leaders must make a decision. Should they stick with their original game plan or follow local legend? This guy was completely sure he's local. He was a local historian as well. So we said, okay, let's give this place a try. The plan is to search the local site first, then move camp and search the historical site. To help in their hunt, the Explorers Club is taking along a pair of world-class divers. We got two top divers that we knew, both cold water divers, living in Mexico with dry suits and plenty of experience. I've worked in British Columbia. I started off diving in the Maldives, Pacific Northwest, the south coast of England, Hawaii, Egypt, Thailand. With the divers now aboard, the question is raised, what exactly are they looking for? I think one of the misconceptions that the general public sometimes have about shipwrecks is that when they sink, they just go down upright and they're sitting on the bottom, perfectly preserved. Obviously that's not the case, particularly with a ship that's 500 years old. What you hope to find is anything you can find at that point. In this case, it would probably be heavy metal objects like cannon, cannonballs, which they use for ballast. Um, perhaps the iron cage they carried to, for prisoners. With everything in order, the team is ready to depart on the trip of a lifetime. The end of the world, the outback, the middle of nowhere. Choose your saying, they all fit for where the expedition is headed, Patagonia. From New York City, there are no direct flights or subway stops. 15 hours by air, four by car, and a three mile walk over the rough Patagonian terrain are all part of the journey. Finally, 5,000 miles and 65 hours later, the team reaches the campsite. They are thrilled to find that the site offers them easy access to the water and scenery worthy of a thousand postcards. We've had an 
incredible, staggering view. I mean, we had an island in front of us that looked like a sculpture. And the cliffs uh, were, were beautiful all the way down. So it was a beautiful spot to be and it was well sheltered. The most pleasant surprise is the weather. The weather was unbelievable. Uh, we had been there before the same time of the year. And the weather then was in the 40s with the wind chill down to 20s and the 30s. And here we are in weather that's calm, it's sunny. While the future is bright for one expedition, it is cloudy for another 480 years earlier. With King Manuel's dismissal, Magellan now faces an unsure future. His dream of sailing west to the Spice Islands seems unreachable. He begins the process of planning his next move. While plotting his future, Magellan is introduced to a mathematical madman with a passion for celestial navigation. His name is Roy Faliero. He was a nut, but he was a smart nut. He was highly respected for his educational background and expertise, and he was a competent mathematician. But he was also crazy, and he had a, a huge ego. He believed that no one knew as much as he did about anything. He knew a lot about astronomy, and he taught Magellan about the dimensions of the world. So, he was one of the greatest influences toward Magellan's project. The crazy mathematician and the composed sailor make for a navigational dream team. Together they begin to plan the voyage that will forever change the way people see the world. As they work out their ideas, the question still looms, who will finance any proposed voyage? Magellan knows there is only one obvious choice. Spain, he knew, had also advanced greatly in uh, exploration and in shipbuilding. And uh, he knew, of course, that uh, Spain was sending out explorers and mariners. While they actively settle the New World, the Spanish have yet to see any profits from their work. The possibility of potential financial gains from the Spice Islands may be enough to entice the young King Charles of Spain to sponsor the voyage. By the fall of 1517, Magellan is ready to present his plan to King Charles. To do so, he is forced to leave behind his family, friends, and the country of his birth. It must have been a terrible decision for him because you have to realize that even minor nobility uh, had a tremendous sense of pride and duty. It must have been agonizing for Magellan to renounce his Portuguese citizenship. Determined. And this is the hallmark of the genius of so many people, that they will not take no for an answer. With Portugal behind him, Magellan crosses the Spanish countryside and settles in Seville. Here he establishes business contacts with people interested in helping him in return for a piece of the potential profits. In February of 1518, Magellan and his party travel to Valladolid, Spain, and await an opportunity to meet with King Charles. They won't have to wait long. Shortly after meeting with the king's court, they are granted an audience with the king himself. The quick turnaround time may have something to do with a member of the court who sees a potential gain in Magellan's voyage. Bishop Fonseca was Bishop of Burgos. He was, in other words, very close to the center of power. So Fonseca was in a position to help people, or not to help them, as he saw fit. He was the one to whom the king turned for all advice on overseas matters. And this included administration, it included exploration, it included the allocation of resources. And so he was critically important to anybody. And in the case of Magellan, he smoothed the way for Magellan and his uh, Portuguese partners to get an entree to see the new king. But Fonseca's support comes at a price. Bishop de Fonseca was a very sly, scheming, conniving man. Bishop Fonseca was evidently a very good businessman in addition to everything else, and had grown wealthy in his office and by making some crucial investments. So we can assume, I think, that he hoped to profit financially. It falls to the composed Magellan to make the presentation to King Charles. 
In a calm, systematic style, he lays out his plans for the voyage. He didn't uh, use fancy court language. I think he was refreshing to uh, young Charles, who was surrounded by these courtiers who used all this flowery language and, and always beat around the bush whenever they talked about anything. I think the young king appreciated that. Magellan doesn't wait long for the king's decision. The 18-year-old king and his court are quick sells. His advisors probably saw the need to essentially find a way to extract some profit from all this exploration and colonization, which was not there. So essentially, it is, a, it, it is imperative that they find a way to reach the East because clearly so far the Americas have not produced essentially a great profit. King Charles is so impressed with Magellan's presentation that he decides to financially sponsor the voyage by himself. For those who have hoped to profit from the expedition, this is a crushing announcement. What astounded and appalled Fonseca was that Charles V without any reservation, gave full crown backing to Magellan. He had already lined up private investors who wanted to gain uh, personal profits from the voyage. So this left them um, unhappy, shall we say. So what Fonseca did then was to try to undermine the authority of Magellan. For Magellan, his problems lay in the future. He is now consumed with preparing for the voyage. He is granted the use of five ships. The Trinidad, San Antonio, Concepcion, and Victoria are Carex, large cargo-carrying vessels, perfect for long voyages. The Caravel Santiago will complete the fleet. As Magellan prepares the ships, there is growing suspicion from Spanish officials about the crew the Portuguese Magellan is assembling. There were literally dozens of voyages going out from Spain that were exploring the route across the Atlantic and the lands that Columbus had first run into. So it's not all that easy to get experienced sailors for any voyage. He started hiring Portuguese, but when the court officials saw that large numbers of Portuguese seamen were being recruited for the fleet, they got frightened. They thought, well, maybe there's some kind of collusion between the King of Portugal and Magellan. Maybe this expedition will be taken over by the Portuguese. And so they tried to stop him from hiring the Portuguese. Led by Bishop Fonseca, the court agrees and places a limit on the number of Portuguese. They also place Spaniards in command of three of the fleet's five ships. Among them is Juan de Cartagena, a close ally of Bishop Fonseca. The seeds of future trouble have been planted. When the dust finally settles, Magellan's crew is an international contingent made up with sailors from as far away as Italy, France, Asia, and England. Among the crew of roughly 270 men, is an Italian in his 20s. Antonio Pigafetta is looking for an opportunity, as he writes, to experience the great and terrible ocean. Unknowingly, his journal will become the most accurate account of the greatest voyage ever. The Explorers Club team has arrived in Argentina, ready to comb the ocean in hopes of finding the last remnants of Magellan's voyage. However, before the divers search the ocean, the search is on for a vital piece of equipment. We need to obviously fill our cylinders with air so that we can actually dive while we're diving underwater. And to do that, we need a compressor. And when we first arrived here in Patagonia, we were brought to the compressor that we we're going to be able to use for the project. And, and first of all, we noticed it was huge. Soon, size doesn't matter. Safety issues are the major concern. It's been homemade, and we're not sure how safe this is. With a mounting list of problems, the team passes on the compressor. Enter the Argentinian army to the rescue. We went to our, our second option, which was the military base, and we found them very helpful, and it was just amazing because we walked into a brand new compressor. What started out to be a major concern ended up being resolved quite nicely. This took some patience and, uh, and time. As the sun is rising, so are the hopes of the team. 
As planned, they begin the hunt by searching the location recommended by the locals. The beautiful weather is holding and the divers are in the water. The conditions couldn't be better, both above and below the surface. The visibility was absolutely outstanding. You can see 10 feet down with no problem. It was like diving in Mexico or in the Caribbean. It was absolutely incredible. I dove those waters before and you never had that kind of visibility. As the divers scour the bottom of the ocean, they pay special attention to the numerous channels that line the ocean floor. Caused by the wind and the waves, the channels provide a perfect hiding spot for debris. These channels head out perpendicularly from the shore into deeper water and they form natural grooves that you would expect things to get stuck in or wedged in, particularly if things are being washed up towards the shoreline. It would hit this natural barrier and then the logical thing is it gets caught in these cracks and crevices. You've got these channels and some of them are two meters plus deep and only half a meter wide so we're able to wedge ourselves down and work our way up. Anxious not to waste one second, the divers search into the early evening hours. They return to camp hungry and tired, but for them it is a small sacrifice. Their dreams and aspirations quickly replace any discomfort. Ferdinand Magellan has sacrificed his homeland and family, all to pursue his dream. Proving that the Spice Islands are reachable by traveling west is his obsession. He knows that by doing so, he can achieve financial riches and glory beyond imagination. He hoped to gain what Columbus and everybody else hoped to gain. Concessions from the crown, to develop trade, to claim lands, wealth, fame, um, everything that went along with that. For Magellan, uh, it was very much a matter of personal ambition. As final touches are being made to prepare the fleet, two obstacles arise before Magellan. The first comes in the form of his partner, Rui Faliero. The unstable mathematician has been busy preparing charts and navigational information for the voyage, but his temperamental behavior is getting the best of him. His craziness caught up with him. His behavior during the whole period of preparation was absolutely outrageous, and uh, he, everyone thought this guy was an absolute kook. Faliero was left behind his volatile behavior too much of a risk. It is now up to Magellan to single-handedly command the fleet. As he prepares to move forward, his past reappears. His old adversary, King Manuel of Portugal, has heard about the planned voyage. Not interested in sharing the wealth of the Spice Islands, Manuel reacts swiftly to the news. O rei Dom Manuel, quando soube que eh, Fernando Magalhães eh, estava a preparar uma viagem para ir às Molucas... When King Manuel learned of Magellan's idea of being sponsored by Spain, he ordered the Portuguese ambassador in Spain to do everything to convince him not to take this voyage. But Magellan will have none of it. He informs the ambassador that his loyalty now lies with King Charles. Upon hearing this, Manuel moves to disrupt the voyage. There was evidently debate at the Portuguese court about uh, simply having Magellan murdered uh, before he had a chance to leave. Manuel stationed ships at various strategic places in the Atlantic where they thought Magellan might head for in, in the hopes of intercepting them and sending them all to the bottom. While Magellan expects problems from Portugal, he does not foresee the impediments placed in front of him by people within Spain. Forces led by Bishop Fonseca continued to question Magellan's loyalty to his adopted country. He had made very clear his loyalty to King Charles, and that was unwavering for the rest of his life. They, one can't suspect him of uh, being a traitor to the interests of the Spanish crown, but it wasn't so clear at the time. Charles V stood behind Magellan, made him a commendador of the Order of Santiago, which was very prestigious, sending a very clear message to Juan and Sandre that Magellan had the royal backing. In August of 1519, with preparations all but complete, the fleet prepares to move out. The crew and their families gather for a farewell mass in Seville. The Captain General Magellan steps forward to the altar. 
the native of Portugal takes to a knee and vows his loyalty to the King of Spain. His officers follow him on the altar. They kneel before the gathered crowd and swear their allegiance to their captain general, promising to follow the course ordered by him and to obey him in everything. Their words will quickly be forgotten. On the 20th of September, 1519, led by the flagship Trinidad, the fleet sails out from San Lucar de Barrameda, Spain, into the Atlantic Ocean. Years of preparation, hard work, and determination have brought Magellan to this point, but his real work is about to begin. Following Magellan's orders, the fleet moves down the coast of Africa and by the Canary Islands. They are blessed with good weather and favorable winds. Their luck is about to change. The fleet sailed for the first two weeks in, in good weather and fair winds, but suddenly they were hit with gales and storms. For crew member Antonio Pigafetta, it is an experience to be remembered and recorded. During these storms, the body of St. Elmo appeared to us several times, and among others, on a night which was very dark, at a time of bad weather, the said saint appeared in the form of a lighted torch at the height of the main top and remained there for more than two hours and a half, a comfort to us all. It's a static electric phenomenon. It's quite common. People who go to sea a lot see it. it it's balls of uh, kind of ball lightning that dances around the rigging and the masts of, of ships during electrical storms. They thought it was a manifestation of Saint Elmo, the patron saint of uh, mariners. Uh, to them, it was a good sign. It was a sign of, of the blessing of the saint. But if the voyage is blessed, there are no immediate signs of it. Following the storms, the convoy hits a period of no winds. The fleet finds itself at a virtual standstill on the high seas. Over a period of 20 days, the ships advance only nine nautical miles. For the crew, these are excruciatingly long days, trapped under the hot sun with little to do. Horrible. The conditions on board these ships were terrible, terrible. Some of the officers lived inside the ships. Most of them lived on the deck, no matter what the weather was. But of course, all this time, all these men had to relieve themselves, and they generally did that into the bilges. And so the, the, the power of uh, sewage gas coming up from the bilges during this stifling no-wind period must have been ungodly. There is growing discontent among the crew, and for the Spanish officers, it provides ammunition to attack Magellan. Seeing an opportunity to cause trouble for their Portuguese captain general, they question even louder the course they are on. The most vocal of the doubters is Bishop Fonseca's appointee, Juan de Cartagena. Calmly, Magellan waits. He is determined not to make the first move. He will wait patiently for his opponents to play their hand first. He doesn't have to wait long. The master of one of the vessels, a man called Salomon, uh, had been charged with sodomy. Magellan convened a, a, a meeting of, uh, of the uh, skippers of all the five ships aboard the flagship. On that occasion, Cartagena chose to challenge Magellan's authority openly. In other words, a call to mutiny, a direct affront and a direct challenge that Magellan could not uh, allow to go unanswered. Magellan got up, grabbed him by the shirt, and told him he was under arrest. Magellan had his master at arms clap Cartagena in irons. And this was precisely the sort of punishment which might have been meted out to a, a lower deck man, but was certainly not usual applied to a noble. The sight of the highest ranking Spaniard in the stocks stuns the crew. Magellan knew his mission was a very dangerous one and a life-threatening one. So he needed to show his authority to the men. The success and victory of his mission depended on his authoritative personality and his commitment not to turn back. Yet in a move to appease the Spaniards, Magellan allows Cartagena to be released and placed in the custody of the captain of the Victoria. 
With Cartagena handled, Magellan moves forward. The winds pick up, and the fleet begins to sail across the Atlantic. Almost three months after they have left San Lucar, they spot the coast of South America. On December 13, 1519, the Trinidad leads the ships into Guanabara Bay, the harbor at Rio de Janeiro. As they enter the harbor, the skies open up and it begins to rain. This is a miraculous sight to the natives who have been suffering through a long drought. It chanced that there had been no rain for two months before we came thither. And the day when we arrived, the rain began so that the people of the place said that we came from heaven and had brought the rain with us, which was a great simplicity. Antonio Pigafetta. Magellan and his men soon find their decks swarming with Indians eager to meet the men who have brought the rain. The best days of the voyage are at hand. There are few tougher places on the globe than the Patagonia region of Argentina. Tough terrain and tough climate make for tough people. Victor Lopez is a local rancher who best exemplifies the resourcefulness needed to survive here. His farm contains both a road and irrigation system that he built himself. It is Lopez's ranch that the team members cross to reach their campsite. Like everyone else the team has met, Lopez is curious to see what the outsiders find. I think this search is a good thing because we will learn our true history. And it will bring some recognition to this region because we have been a bit forgotten. On a sparkling evening, Lopez opens his home to his new friends. The team is treated to a barbecue, Patagonian style. It takes about two hours to cook this meal. I'm not a chef, so I don't know exactly. They were all been wonderful. This is a, a good example of the tremendous warmth that we've felt with all the people here. They've been, they've been terrific. I like everyone on this project. I wish I hadn't met them earlier. I wish them success on their search. The first days have brought good weather and good times. Expedition members are hopeful that if the weather holds, they will uncover the secrets of the Santiago. But the fourth day at the campsite starts poorly. Patagonia is home to some of the widest tidal ranges in the world. The difference between low and high tide can be up to 30 feet. A missed high tide leaves the divers high and dry and the Zodiac boat stuck in the mud. As the tide is going out, the weather is coming in. The infamous winds of Patagonia have made their presence felt. And this weather has been kind to us, but if it changes, we're in deep trouble because uh, these waves could pick up and be real, rather large, up to say three meters high, and you can't dive in that, you can't even get a boat out. Well, it appears like we've, uh, got, these winds are starting to break our camp up. We, we gotta go help right now. We'll have to abandon this project. And the wind's ripping our, lifting our tent. It looks like it's gonna go back. We're gonna have to work over there pretty quickly once we're done here. After securing the campsite, the expedition leaders meet to discuss their strategy. A decision is made to move the search north to the second site. We thought we'd come here and do the dives around this area and also do some archaeological digs. And we've done that. We've been here about four days. And we've checked out all the potential locations that were indicated to us, and they haven't panned out. When the tide comes back in, the team moves out. So at this point, we want to break it up and take half of the group toward the Santa Cruz River and work our way up about 10 kilometers to where the historical information says that the Santiago was actually sunk. The good weather of the first couple of days has allowed the team to cross off the area recommended by the locals. While one expedition is battling the weather, another is enjoying it. For Magellan's crew of approximately 270 men, Rio de Janeiro seems like paradise. There is a bounty of fresh fruit and vegetables for the crew to enjoy. And the natives are more than willing to supply the men with food and trade. 
as seaman Antonio Pigafetta later wrote in his journal. For a fish hook or a knife, they would offer five or six chickens, a pair of geese for a comb. For the king, in a deck of playing cards such as we use in Italy, they gave me six chickens, thinking that they had got the better of me. For the natives, the trinkets supplied by the sailors are priceless, and they offer just about anything in exchange for them. They were perfectly willing to trade with Magellan's ships, and they were also very friendly in a sexual way, and this was of obvious appeal uh, to the men on the ships as well. <laughs> it was the best liberty port they'd ever seen. It was populated by extremely friendly Indians who wore nothing whatsoever, and the women were quite attractive, and the men were quite willing to uh, sell their wives, daughters, anything for trinkets and, uh, and gewgaws, so uh, the men had a ball. Soon the men become more interested with enjoying the company of the native women than their chores. For a while, their captain general sits back and lets the men sow their wild oats. He let them uncork for a while, but uh, uh, it began to get out of hand, as such things usually do. It just got worse and worse and worse. Magellan laid down uh, guidelines. First, that no women should be on board the vessels. In practice, this turned out to be absolutely impossible to implement. He tried to keep a bit of control over what the men did, but at the same time, he knew that he could not be uh, rigidly uh, enforcing absolute separateness between the crews and the, the local peoples, or the men were likely to mutiny on him. For two weeks, the men enjoy everything Real has to offer. With winter around the corner, the crew is more than willing to stay in Rio until the spring. Magellan, however, realizes the potential dangers of this. The area that we call Brazil now was clearly within the Portuguese sphere of influence. So the longer Magellan and the voyage stayed, the more risk there was of clashing with Portuguese authorities. On the morning of December 26, 1519, Magellan lifts anchor and heads down the coast of South America. As the fleet pulls away, the sounds of crying of native girlfriends left behind fills the air. The fleet will spend the next several weeks working its way south along the coastline. As winter begins to close in, the crew finds itself battling storms daily. It was a pretty rough coast along there, and the weather was getting progressively worse. Storms were increasing, and in fact, several of them had damaged their ships very badly. The cold weather and warm memories of Rio play with the crew's emotions. They plead with Magellan to return to Rio and wait out the winter. Magellan will have none of it. He promises King Charles a westward route to the Spice Islands. Anything that deviates from that goal is unacceptable. Magellan understands that this is his one chance at glory. He has turned his back on his homeland and has a rival king's support. There is no room for failure. Ferdinand Magellan had a very strong personality. He had an objective to complete, and he knew if he gave up, the king would not forgive him. He saw a goal that would help him rise in society, become wealthy, become important, become trusted. And he pursued that ambition. After weeks of misery, Magellan's fleet reaches a harbor that he calls San Julian. He tells the fleet to anchor, for they will be spending the winter here. It will be a long winter. With clear weather and perfect conditions, the Explorers Club team seizes the opportunity to spend the first days of their Argentinian expedition scouring the ocean floor in search of remains of Magellan's lost ship, the Santiago. Day four, however, brings wind gusts, choppy seas, and a new game plan. The reason we came here is because there was some local knowledge that suggested that this might be a good place to actually begin our search for the Santiago. While we've been here, we've been able to do a number of dives, and we've checked out all the potential locations that were indicated to us, and they haven't panned out. We're gonna get out of here with a crew and search the shore 
about nine miles from Santa Cruz River. So we're making camp there. But Mother Nature has other ideas. The 40 mile per hour winds that frequent Patagonia have made their presence felt. The team is forced to scrap plans for a second campsite and retreats to a hotel in the nearby town of Santa Cruz. But if we simply Expedition leaders use the time to fine tune their strategy. Given the weather conditions that we have in this area and the huge tidal range and everything else, the anything that's left is hopefully going to be wedged into these channels. Maps are studied, charts examined, and strategy debated. What we're hoping for is whatever got trapped before it got pushed off, it would just be kept being pushed further and further in. The weather is putting any diving on hold. Even the hotel isn't safe from the winds. The room that just minutes ago hosted team members is now covered in glass, the large picture window smashed by a gust of wind. We could do like Magellan did, throw a few anchors down and, <laughs> and make a mad dash for the camp. <laughs> well, the Argentinian Coast Guard refuses to let the team out into the Atlantic Ocean, they do grant permission for them to travel to a nearby Penguin Beach. <laughs> For expedition members, it is an opportunity to see up close what Magellan and his crew experienced centuries before. The penguins that we saw, they were called Magellan penguins, uh, Magellan penguins. And you can only imagine what they thought about these birds when they saw them for the first time. We discovered two islands full of geese and goslings. And these goslings are black and have feathers over their whole body of the same size and fashion, and they do not fly and they live on fish. And they are so fat we did not pluck them, but skin them. And they have a beak like a crow's. Antonio Pigafetta. Under the sea, the divers are joined by sea lions and commerce and dolphins. Usually you see it with binoculars or somebody will point it. In this case, we were so lucky that Probably the whole trip, we were completely surrounded with these dolphins. We can even touch them. It definitely made the whole trip a lot more interesting. For the members of the expedition, interacting with the wildlife isn't how they planned on spending their time in Argentina. While frustrating, team members understand the power of the sea. Any time you're dealing with the ocean, you have to respect it as a very powerful force. These modern explorers aren't the only ones who have learned the force of the Patagonian weather. In April of 1520, Magellan's fleet is stationed in Port San Julian. Their mission of discovering a westward route to the Spice Islands on hold until the harsh winter breaks. That was a pretty rough coast along there, and the weather was getting progressively worse. Uh, storms were increasing, and in fact, several of them had damaged their ships very badly. Horrendous. Basically, once you get south of about 40 degrees south, you pick up these beginnings of the Roaring Forties, these horrible, horrible westerly winds, and they were fairly devastating for these little ships. And when they did encounter the opening at uh, Port St. Julian, why it was, uh, it was a blessing for Magellan because the, the ships were pretty well beaten up by the time they got down there. The men are also beaten up. The cry goes up to return to Spain. Magellan, the captain general, refuses. Well, Magellan's determination is, is part of the story of the, the greatness of the man. Magellan was a very, very tough, uncompromising fellow, and he knew he was charged with going to the Spice Islands via the West, and nothing was going to stop him. The Castilian skippers decided that uh, this was time, if they were ever going to get rid of this nut, who was heading the expedition, why, uh, they'd better do it now. Under the cover of night, Magellan's old adversary reappears. Juan de Cartagena conspires with officers aboard the Concepcion and Victoria to take control of the two ships. Before sunrise, mutineers take the San Antonio by force. A sleeping Magellan has no idea that three of the fleet's five ships are now out of his control. However, Magellan learnt of it, and instead of using force, he used guile. The Captain General coolly puts his counter plan into motion. He sends a longboat to the Victoria with a message. As the mutineer leaders read Magellan's note, the signal is given. 
Soon the deck is swarming with Magellan loyalists and the ship is taken back. So the tables were now in Magellan's favor, three to two. And what he was able to do was to take the Victoria, the Trinidad, and the Santiago and blockade the port. So the other two vessels could not get out. The San Antonio then uh, tried to make a run for it and uh, the Castilian skipper made a damn fool of himself and uh, uh, they, they, they got nowhere with it and uh, then the other ship surrendered. So the mutiny was very capably and ably put down by a man who knew his naval tactics. With the fleet again under his control, Magellan sets out to discipline the conspirators. Weary of Cartagena's connections back in Spain, Magellan once again spares him. Cartagena is sentenced to be confined to his quarters. He doesn't go quietly. Shortly after being sentenced, Cartagena and the fleet chaplain are found trying to incite another mutiny. This time Magellan shows no leniency. Both men are sentenced to be marooned. With the Cartagena problem resolved, Magellan turns his focus to solving the crew's supply shortage. The Captain General sends out the Santiago to look for food. As the Santiago sails down the coast, disaster strikes. On May 22nd, uh, 1522, they got hit at some point by a squall storm. They made for land, they dragged their anchors, they hit the shoreline, and they at least were saved. The crew survives, finding an escape route through the cliff-filled beach. In the dead of winter, the men make it back to the Santa Cruz River. Serrano then selects two men to trek over the Patagonian badlands back to San Julian and the fleet. When they arrived at Port St. Julian, their former shipmates didn't recognize them. They were so gaunt and emaciated. Uh, but uh, as soon as Magellan found out that this had happened, he sent an overland expedition and loaded with food and supplies and everything, and uh, they were able to make it. The crew of the Santiago aren't the only ones making an appearance in San Julian. For crew member Antonio Pigafetta, it is a sight to behold. One day, without anyone expecting it, we saw a giant who was unsure, quite naked, and who danced and leaped and sang, and while he sang, he threw sand and dust on his head. The peoples of, of Patagonia were quite tall, uh, very tall, in fact, probably close to six feet tall in our reckoning. But Europeans were not very tall at that time, so to see anyone that tall would have been noteworthy. The natives capture the fascination of the crew, including Magellan. His eyes are drawn to their feet, which are wrapped in guanaco skin. He said they, they were dog-footed, and in Spanish that comes out to something like Patagones. And so to this day, that area is called Patagonia, and the people that live there are called Patagonians. In August 1520, the fleet finally heads out of San Julian, headed toward Santa Cruz. Before they leave, Magellan takes care of one last piece of business. They put uh, Cartagena and the priest in a longboat and rode him out to a little island right near the entrance, I guess, and just abandoned them there. Santa Cruz allows the fleet to replenish supplies. They will be needed. Tough times lie straight ahead. After several disappointing days, things are looking up for the expedition party. They wake to a break in the weather. The place that we are going to dive. With only a few days left in the expedition, team members are anxious to carry on the search for the Santiago. Spirits are high as they head out of port. How long is it going to take us to get to our spot? Probably about an hour. Escorted by one of the smaller Zodiacs, the boat with the divers makes its way down the Santa Cruz River into the Atlantic Ocean. But as the team cruises for the search site, trouble is on the horizon. The weather conditions started to change and the wind started to pick up. And the waves were very heavy. In a matter of half an hour, the weather conditions were very bad. 
While hungry to hunt, the team members are respectful of the power of the ocean. A decision is made. We decided to turn back, but we said safety is not good. I mean, we're not going to dive. As they head back, the Zodiac boat falls out of sight. We started looking for it, but it was impossible because the waves were very high. Anxious team members scan the water looking for the lost vessel. We need to find those guys. Suddenly, the Santiago is an afterthought. The Zodiac has become the true focus of the search. With its engines at full power, the big boat struggles to make it back to port and safety. The force of the river current makes for slow going. We couldn't even move. We can actually see that we were not moving. It, it, was, it was touch and go. You know, the radios weren't working, everything was wet. The Zodiac is still nowhere in sight. The crew is hopeful that their comrades have stuck close to shore, thus allowing access to the beach in case of an emergency. We get back to port and didn't appear, didn't appear, didn't appear. So we called the Coast Guard. Things have started getting a little bit nervous. Everybody was nervous about where they were. As team members prepare a search party, a black dot appears on the horizon. It's the Zodiac. Safely ashore, there is a relieved exchange of stories. What had actually happened is, is they got held up on shore. The waves were, were strong on shore as well, and they had some engine problems, and they, they got stranded on the beach for, for a while. For the crew of the expedition, the day brings a new appreciation for what Magellan's fleet faced centuries before. We're talking about uh, a wreck that happened 500 years ago. They don't have all the modern aids that we've got, satellite navigation, outboard motors, dry suits. And those guys were doing an amazing thing. They were circumnavigating the world for the first time ever. They were true explorers in the real sense of the word. October of 1520, spring has finally sprung in Argentina. With supplies replenished and repairs made, Magellan moves his fleet out of Santa Cruz and down the coastline. If you can just imagine these rather bleak coasts of um, once you get south of Cabo San Julian, it's miserable, it's cold, it's hostile, it's windy, and there seems no way through. They are sailing where no European has ever sailed, looking for a passageway they aren't even sure exists. There are no maps, charts, or graphs, just the Captain General's instincts. Shortly after passing the latitude of 52 degrees south, those instincts pay off. The fleet spots an opening. Magellan was anxious to find out whether the passageway ahead of them kept going to the west. So he sent the Concepcion and the San Antonio on a scouting expedition. And another storm arose. It must have been terrifying. Huge waves, incredible, very fickle winds going to you know, 120 miles an hour. Ships heeling over, everyone terrified, thinking we're going to die. Magellan is fearful that the two ships have been lost. He nervously waits for a sign of them. We thought indeed that they had perished. First because of the great storm, and then we had not seen them for two days. And while in suspense we saw the two ships approaching under full sail, their banners coming toward us. Antonio Pigafetta. They've obviously been somewhere because their decks are covered with bunting. All the sailors are out on the deck. They're cheering one another. And when they come close to each other, they tell the story. Their story is the one the crew has been dreaming of. A year into their voyage, they have found the passageway. So suddenly, from being despondent and depressed and demoralized, the people on these four ships are joyous. I'm absolutely overjoyed. Magellan orders the fleet to move forward. But as they enter the straits, it becomes obvious that this will be no pleasure cruise. For the crew of the San Antonio, the wind and cold are too much. As the ship ventures out on a scouting mission, Pilot Gomez expresses concern to his shipmates. It's this pilot who rallies the other officers on the ship 
when they are sent to explore a side channel of, of the strait um, and calls up all of their old fears. Gomez uh, told the officers in the crew, look, this Captain General is out of his mind. We're all going to die a frozen death. They simply voted to turn around and sail back to Iberia. This was very serious because it was the largest ship in the fleet and carried many of the supplies that they knew they would need collectively. As Magellan's fleet continues their voyage, the San Antonio makes it safely back to Spain. Their crew members vilify Magellan before the king's court. When they got back, it was incumbent upon them to blacken the name of Magellan. Otherwise, they couldn't justify the fact that they had deserted a voyage in the king's name. And so blacken his name, they did. They accused him of cruelty, of brutality, and worse. Magellan assumes the San Antonio is gone, and with it, his reputation. He understands that the only way to win back his name is to return to Spain with a fleet load of riches. To do that, he first must make it through the passageway. The Straits of Magellan are fascinating by their changing scenery. You can never relax them. There can become sudden storms, very localized storms. You can actually see them coming across the water to you. There are a hundred potential routes through the strait, most of them blind alleys, of course. It is also extraordinarily difficult in terms of weather. There can be horrible storms in the strait. It's a, it's a terrifying passage at the best of times. 38 days after entering the straits, the fleet comes upon an opening. On November 28, 1520, the straits that will forever bear his name are behind Magellan. He has reached the Great South Sea. The weather suddenly became quiet and calm and the sun shone and it was warm. And Magellan said, I named this sea the Mare Pacifico because it's a Pacific sea. So it must have been quite an amazing moment. And Magellan, according to Pigafetta, cried, broke down and wept. And to think of this extraordinarily tough captain who'd been through so much all of his life, breaking down and weeping, uh, you can imagine what sort of tension he must have been under. He could finally see success at the end of all his troubles. He thought he was three quarters of the way home. So he sailed brimming with confidence out of the strait. They have no idea that their journey isn't even half over. For most, patience is a virtue. In Patagonia, it is a necessity. While well, technology has improved over the centuries, it is still no match for Mother Nature. One of the things that you learn very quickly diving is what the sea takes. She doesn't give up very easily, and she has a lot of secrets and mysteries. Steve and I are used to spending a lot of time underwater. We're, we're prepared to spend hours a day in a day, six hours plus, whatever it takes, and, and we're equipped physically, mentally, and, and every other way in order to do that, and we haven't been able to. We've tried to take every opportunity that we could, but at the same time, you have to understand that just because time's running out, you can't make poor decisions, it's always safety first. And you have to take those frustrations in your stride. A new day hasn't brought new weather. The Coast Guard once again denies permission for the team to leave port. With time evaporating, expedition leaders decide to attack the second site by land. The plan is to hike to the area and examine it with their own eyes. Expedition members are eager to see if the historical site contains the necessary escape routes that would provide a way out for the crew of the Santiago. You cannot underestimate the need for an escape route because even a, a wall 10 to 15, 20 feet high, which was minor league in, in, in that area, I mean, we're talking about walls that go up three or 400 feet. So it was critical that we find a place where we could get down, but also easily get out of, so that we could find out whether or not that was possible then. Up hills, down gullies, and through the mud, the team treks over the same rough terrain that the Santiago survivors crossed to reach safety. You're walking in the same path, the same route as somebody 500 years ago, 
and I can only imagine what it will be for them to walk that terrain in those conditions with no food and in winter, uh, it's not easy. The second site is actually two sites in one, separated by less than a mile. The team arrives at the first part of the site and is thrilled at what they find. The drop off at this point from here down is about six feet only, maybe six and a half feet, which would be no problem for 36 men, you know, having been shipwrecked with lumber and so forth from the ship to get up here and out. The other place may be even better. The second half of the site doesn't disappoint either. It also offers an escape route. Well, if this is beautiful summer conditions, I can't imagine what it was like when the ship actually crashed. And these guys had to navigate this terrain, sub-zero temperatures. This is the second place that has the exit point. There are no others within that 10-mile magic range they talk about. So we should be in the right spot. And what we want to do is really dive this place if we can tomorrow, this, these two spots thoroughly, and see if we can pick up whatever we can in the way of the past history of the Santiago. Confident that they have found the site where the Santiago went down, the team must now cross their fingers that the weather will allow them the chance to search the waters. Magellan's fleet has suffered through the loss of dozens of men and two of its ships, but now there is hope. The Straits of Magellan are behind them, and the Captain General believes the Spice Islands are close by. He only thought that they were perhaps a few hundred or at most a thousand or so miles away. They thought it would take maybe three or five days to get to the Spice Islands. Three or five days quickly turns into three months. The high spirits that came with reaching the Pacific quickly diminishes, as does the food supply. We ate only old biscuits turned to powder, all full of worms and stinking of the urine which the rats had made on it, having eaten the good. And we drank water impure and yellow, and of the rats which were sold for half an ecu apiece, some of us could not get enough. Antonio Pigaveta. The Pacific Ocean is littered with islands. Every single one they managed to miss, some of them by only 20 and 30 miles. I mean, can you imagine how nice it would have been if they had stopped at Tahiti and, you know, breadfruit and pretty girls and water and all of their troubles would have been over. The dream began to fade. Magellan, who always believed in himself, had still at this point even had to convince himself that it was just one more day, just one more day, and he had to convince the men of this as well. Finally, their luck changes. They spot two islands, what we know today as Guam and Rota. The initial joy at finding the islands is short-lived. Before they know what hits them, the fleet is surrounded by natives in canoes. In minutes, the ship decks are swarming with islanders looting the vessels. Among the items stolen is one of Magellan's long boats. The loss of the skiff is too much for the Captain General to swallow. He, being very angry, went ashore with 40 armed men and burning some 40 or 50 houses with several boats and killing seven men of the said island, they recovered the skiff. Antonio Pigafetta. With his boat recovered, Magellan and the fleet quickly leave, but not before he names the islands Islas de Ladrones, the Isle of Thieves. Back on the high seas, the fleet is once again in search of land. It comes only a few days later as they hit the Philippines. After island hopping, they pull into the harbor at the Isle of Cebu. They are warmly greeted by the natives. Listening to the advice of his advisors, island leader Raja Humaban quickly befriends Magellan. Humaban is especially intrigued by the Captain General's religious evangelism. That's something that we don't usually read about Magellan, but it was a very important part of his enterprise, uh, not only to, to him, but also to the king of Spain. This was, um, was part of the whole enterprise of going overseas, was to bring the word of Christ to peoples who had not yet heard of Christianity. He manages to persuade the chief and the leading people that indeed they should be baptized. A ceremony is held, a platform built, 
on Easter Sunday, over 800 natives will be baptized. The Captain General's religious fervor continues to grow over the next several days as hundreds more are converted. He thought that the Virgin Mary must be sitting on his shoulder and, and guiding him so that he could do no wrong. So he let his guard down completely and he just went overboard and became a, a passionate missionary. Believing that he is doing God's work, the Captain General develops a feeling of invincibility. So confident is Magellan that he brags that he can even make Humabon's bitter enemies on the nearby island of Mactan recognize the Christian King Charles as their leader. When notified of Magellan's intentions, Mactan leader Lapu Lapu is less than impressed. Lapu Lapu said he wasn't having any of this bowing to the religious demands of an alien white man and he was going to stand up for the rights of the local people. So Magellan said, well, he said, I'll take care of that guy and I'll show you the, the, the real force of Spanish arms. And Humabon uh, said, well, <laughs> I've had experience with this guy. <laughs> and then I've attacked him many times and I've always failed. You better watch this guy. Magellan, rather uncharacteristically in a way, loses a sense of balance, loses a sense of good judgment, and now allows almost a jingoism and a sense of European superiority. Blinded by his religious passions, Magellan leads a force of 60 men to Mactan for a surprise attack. It is the worst decision of his life. They arrive at low tide, thus not able to land. The men, dressed in armor, wade through the water to make it to shore. They are greeted by a force of 3,000. They fired at us so many arrows and lances of bamboo tipped with iron and pointed stakes hardened by fire and stones that we could hardly defend ourselves. Seeing this, the captain sent some of his men to burn the houses of these people in order to frighten them who, seeing their houses burning, became bolder and more furious. Antonio Pigaveta. Magellan realized that they were in deep trouble, so he ordered them to retreat. And he himself, uh, being the leader and having gotten them into that, he felt responsible for it. So he, he was in the vanguard of the, of the men trying to hold off these uh, howling uh, savages. As his men make their way back to safety, Magellan stands in the water's edge, battling the surging natives. Suddenly, he is hit in the leg by a poisonous arrow. As the injured leader collapses into the waters, the Mactan warriors pounce, bludgeoning Magellan with their spears. The man who had willed the voyage to this point is gone. For the crew, it is an overwhelming loss. They were devastated because he represented the strength of will and the knowledge to bring them safely back home. Without him, there was no central control, no command left. I mean, it was, the, the, the body was without a head. I hope that the renown of so valiant and noble a captain will not be extinguished or fall into oblivion in our time. And that that is true was seen openly for no other had so much natural talent, boldness, or knowledge to sail once around the world as he already planned, Antonio Pigaveta. But the fleet's troubles are far from over. Raja Humaban decides his new friends are more trouble than they're worth. Four days after Magellan's death, he invites the remaining officers to a feast. The idea was to dispatch them, get them drunk, and then kill them all. While the officers are enjoying the banquet, the signal is given. The men are attacked, their throats cut. The surviving men quickly prepare to escape from Cebu, only to find the Concepcion too worn down to sail. The Concepcion is set ablaze as the two remaining ships head out. In less than a week, the fleet has lost one of its ships, several of its skilled officers, and the one man who has carried his men more than halfway around the world, and they are still over 10,000 miles from home. It has been over a year and a half since Magellan's fleet of five ships sailed out of Seville. 
a voyage with aspirations of riches and glory has been filled with pain and misery. Despite these hardships, the crew carries on, inspired by the memory of their late Captain General, Magellan. But amazingly, they pulled themselves together, essentially saying, what would he have liked us to do? They determined that they would see it through to the end because that's what our leader, as they put it, would have required, would have wished of us. After months of drifting aimlessly around the Pacific Ocean, the remaining fleet discovers its long-awaited target. We discovered four high islands to the east. And this, our pilot who had remained with us said that these four islands were Maluka. Wherefore we gave thanks to God and for our great joy discharged all our artillery. Antonio Pigareta. The Mulukas, otherwise known as the Spice Islands, the spice-rich land Magellan had dreamed of, King Charles had desired, and the men had prayed for, are now in sight. The ecstatic fleet enters the harbor in the island of Tidori, where they are warmly greeted by the islanders. For the 107 remaining men, these are the best times since Rio, 23 months earlier. They found the people were extremely friendly. They were quite willing to trade with them. It was a delightful place. And indeed, they found the source of, of infinite wealth. You knew it just when you saw it, the cloves, the nutmeg, the mace. They spent their time very constructively there, making treaties with all the little rajas of, from each island, and they were just loading the ships. They crammed the holes of these ships with, uh, with cloves. So crammed are the ships that when the Victoria and Trinidad go to leave, there is a problem. The ship named Victoria made sail and stood out a little awaiting the ship Trinidad. But the latter, not being able to weigh anchor, quickly sprang a leak in her bottom. We began diligently to lighten the Trinidad to see whether we could repair her. Antonio Pigaveta. With monsoon season coming, the Victoria can't wait for the Trinidad to be fixed. It moves out under Captain Juan Sebastian del Cano. The Trinidad will never make it out of the Pacific. After repairs, the ship sets sail for Spain, but lacking able pilots, the vessel ends up drifting aimlessly around the Pacific. So the Trinidad has to turn back. Some of the men die. They eventually are captured by Portuguese authorities in the East Indies. Now there is only one ship left, the Victoria. It is loaded with both spices and disease. But by the time they got uh, off the coast of Africa, they were running short of uh, fresh water and fresh uh, vegetables necessary to keep the men healthy and prevent them from getting scurvy. They had no source of vitamin C, and so their teeth started getting loose in their sockets. They began to get enormous boils. They began to suffer from melancholia and depression and to die. Captaining the Victoria is one Sebastian Del Cano. Just months earlier, he was one of the mutineers in San Julian. Now he leads the last remaining ship of the fleet. Juan Sebastian Del Cano was a Basque mariner of a lot of experience. He was a rough sort. He wasn't the first choice for a leader after Magellan died, but everyone else fell by the wayside, one way or another. In May of 1522, the crew is once again at a breaking point. They have just passed around the Cape of Good Hope and are continuing up the African coast. They have ventured over 30,000 miles and many will not live through the final stages. Then we sailed northwest for two months continually without taking any refreshment or repose. And in that short space of time, 21 of our men died. And if God had not given us good weather, we should all have died of hunger. At length, constrained by our great need, we went to the islands of Cape Verde, Antonio Pigaveta. The problem is that the Cape Verde islands fall under Portuguese control. Despite the risk, Del Cano anchors the Victoria and sends 13 men ashore. Pretending to be from a merchant ship, the men go searching for supplies and food. He managed to get some provisions from them without his cover being blown. But then it appears that one of his men, whilst they were trading in the Cape Verdes, offered to pay with spices. And immediately, the local leadership 
was on the alert and actually uh, arrested these men. With their cover blown, the Victoria takes off. The men ashore are left behind. Finally, on Monday, the 8th of September, 1522, the Victoria sails into Seville. There we discharged all the artillery. And on Tuesday, we went in our shirts and barefoot, and each with a torch in hand, to visit the shrine of Santa Maria de la Victoria, Antonio Pigaveta. Of the 270 men who departed with Magellan, there are just 18 left to carry torches that night. They are sick, emaciated, and heroes. None more so than the returning Captain Del Cano. The king was obviously very happy to have the voyage return successfully. Cano was very clear that he was the first to have circumnavigated the globe and claimed this. Sebastian Del Cano was, was fated. He was given the most wonderful coat of arms, which had spices, which had nutmegs and ships and anchors. It's a wonderfully gaudy thing. But he was also, more importantly, given a globe of the world, tricked out in gold and diamonds, with the motto, Primus Circumdediste Me on it. Thou first circumnavigated me. Forgotten in the celebration is the man whose dream launched the voyage, Ferdinand Magellan. It would take years for historians to separate fact from fiction, and in doing so, give Magellan the legacy he deserved. Close to 500 years later, a crew of men are trying to add to that legacy by uncovering the Santiago. With only one day left in their expedition, the team is still optimistic that they can unravel the mystery. If the early morning skies are any indication, today is promising. The skies are clear and the winds low. Eager to make the most of the day, team members awake early to attempt a new approach to the search. We rented a plane and a pilot, and we decided that the only time we could fly that route was like 6 or 6.30 in the morning before the winds came up. We make the same route as Serrano did with his boat, with his Santiago. We came out from Santa Cruz with the plane, and we flew over the whole coast. It was perfect. The light gave us the shadows so that we could clearly see canyons and any break in the walls. We were close, we were at the right angle, and we could capture both the water, the beach, the cliffs, and the highlands. The entire stretch. The view confirms what the team saw from ground level. There are only a handful of escape routes from the ocean. And more importantly, the only ones near the 10 mile point are the ones they have targeted at the second site. What we have in a sense is a checkoff. It has to be within a four to five mile day walk and it has to be about, about 10 nautical miles. We just happen to find the only place that measures up. Re-energized by what they learned from their flight, Expedition members are eager to hit the water. I think we're going to have a little bit of waves at the entrance. Well, we probably will. Getting through. It's, it's the calmest I've seen. It. As they leave port, they are hopeful that with a full day of diving, they can unlock the secrets of the Santiago. However, the anticipation is short-lived. We're all pretty optimistic that finally we're going to get this opportunity the very last day. And lo and behold, we were again denied access to the site. Um, this time, it was large ocean swells. You come here with high hopes, and you come here with a good team and all the technology and everything to do it right. But if we don't have a little bit of luck with the weather, then unfortunately, it, it can mean that, uh, try as you might, you can't quite get the job done. Well, disappointed that they are unable to locate any wreckage, team members take pride in what they accomplished. I believe we found the spot where the Santiago wrecked. Now, whether there's anything in those ravines out in the waters, we don't know, but it's certainly worthwhile going back to find out. At least we know the location. There's always another day. The wreck's been here 500 years. It's gonna be here a lot longer. We can always come back, spend some more time, do some more diving and attempt to find it again. For Explorers Club members, the joy isn't just in the results, but in the expedition itself. I think with a project like this, or any type of expedition or exploration project, the goal is great and it's important to have a goal during the project. Having said that, sometimes, you know, the journey is just as important. It's the looking that's important. 
and always exploring new areas of the world and of ourselves. The same can be said for the Odyssey of Magellan centuries earlier. The westward passage to the Spice Islands never proved feasible, the route too rough and treacherous. Magellan's voyage itself proved to be far less financially rewarding than hoped. The cargo of the Victoria barely paid for the expedition. The personal glory and fame Magellan had dreamt of appeared to vanish on the shores of Mactan. Yet, Close to five centuries later, these details are mostly forgotten. It is the bravery and the spirit of the man who led the voyage that is remembered. His legacy uh, is enormous because for the first time, it gave us an appreciation of the shape and size of our world. He was brave. He has imagination. He also showed how very difficult that westward route around the landmass was. The Strait of Magellan is not easy. An extraordinary determined man, unflinching courage, a man who set no boundaries for himself. It was like opening a book, an encyclopedia, or with this beautiful set of maps in it to a student who doesn't know any of these things. Magellan gave this to the world without knowing it. That wasn't his objective, but he did it and we have to respect him for that.